All right. Good morning. Happy anniversary. 33 years Seven Lakes Baptist Church has been in existence. And some of you have been here from the very beginning. If you were at the first service of Seven Lakes Baptist Church, I want you to stand if you're not working somewhere else. Bobby Sue, were you alive? Mike, where's Mike Martin? Mike Monroe. Oh, Mike Monroe's back there. You didn't stand, Mike. Oh, okay. <laughs> you played ho- you played hooky on the first service? <laughs> where's Mary Hankins? Mary, you didn't stand up either. Okay. Well, you're, she, I just couldn't see you back there. But God is so good. For 33 years, God's been faithful to Seven Lakes Baptist Church, and, uh, and I'm excited. I'm excited about this message because, to be honest with you, I have been looking and looking and looking and searching, what do I preach for an anniversary service for the 33rd anniversary? You know, today is kind of a, uh, there's a heavy air because we know people that have COVID, that are in the hospital, um, things that are going on, people that were um, there from the very beginning. But I, but I, was going through Ephesians again, and we've been, in, we've been going through the book of Ephesians, and right where I left off, I just went and read through there again, and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 20 is where we're going to be today. And it's just, it was just absolutely spoke to my heart this morning. So I want to read this, uh, read this passage, and then I'll explain to you why it spoke to my heart so much, and what, uh, what it, how relevant it is for today. It says, therefore, remember... That at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through, one, or through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And He came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. For through Him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined, to, or being joined together grows in a holy temple to the Lord. In him also you are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. And Father, as we look at your word, Lord, your perfect law of liberty, I pray, God, that as we do so, Lord, we remember... God, that we remember uh, who we were before you, Lord, and how lost and separated we were from you. But God, also that we remember, Lord, that, that God, you birthed this church out of salvation, Lord, and the salvation of many people in this church, Lord, that you birthed this church. And God, that we are standing on the shoulders of the apostles and, and the prophets, Lord, but also the, the men and women that started this church and that, that worked their whole lives to honor you. God, I pray that most of all, Lord, that as we continue that work, Lord, as we realize, God, that it didn't end when somebody dies. It doesn't end when that's over, Lord. This is your work. It's your church. And Father, I pray, God, that you will give us a new vision and a new vigor and a new excitement for what you're going to do. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll be glorified through everything that's said and done this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
First thing I want us to see is the, the sermon is called Remember because this is what Paul's telling them after we went through chapter 1 and, and the first part of chapter 2, Paul was showing them that they were lost and they were destitute without Christ, that they were without hope. In fact, they were already dead, but God made them alive because of what Jesus Christ did in the resurrection. We talked in that first week how we have the resurrection power at our fingertips. That resurrection power that can transform somebody from a wicked sinner to a saint of God. God, that changes our lives, that shows us exactly who we're called to be. And here we come to chapter 2, the middle part of chapter 2, and, the, and he tell, Paul tells us in verses 11 through 13, he says, So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised. Now let me just give you a picture here. Here's Paul, and, and Paul's telling them that at this church at Ephesus, there was just a handful of Jews. And the Jews and the Gentiles really didn't want anything to do with one another. In fact, they didn't like each other. So the Jews called the Gentiles, you uncircumcised people. And the Gentiles were called the uncircumcised. So it was kind of a bitter term. And so look what it says. It says, so then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised. Done with the hand of the flesh. At the time you were without the Messiah. You were excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise with no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. Now it's important that we remember where we come from. Paul's making it clear here that without Christ, we were completely alienated. And I think it's a good place for us to start is to remember who I was before Christ. And I'll tell you something, if you're the same person with Christ than you were without Christ, before Christ, then you don't know Christ. Because Jesus Christ transforms our lives. He changes our mind. He changes the way we think. He changes our action. Why? Because that's what He came to do. That's why He died. That's why He resurrected. So we would have that resurrection power that can change somebody. A drug addict that comes clean and surrenders everything to God. That's what Christ did. In Ephesus, again, there was only a handful of Jews and mostly Gentiles. The Jews called the Gentiles uncircumcised and the Gentiles called the Jews circumcised. There was a distinction because of pride. There was division. Jews thought that they were better than the Gentiles and the Gentiles felt slighted because of it. I don't know about you, but nobody likes to be called names, do they? They used to always say, you know, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. That's garbage. Because words mean things and words hurt. God says, I brought you together. You're no longer Jews and Gentiles. As Gentiles, we were not aligned with the covenants that God had given to Israel. In our, uh, there, there, there's a covenant called the Abrahamic covenant, and there's four parts of that covenant. And on, that, on that, those four parts, God gave Abraham, He promised him, Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will make you a great nation, Abraham. Uh, there should be a slide up there, Ava, on... There we go. So we have the Abrahamic covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, God promised that that he would make him a great nation. And uh, coming alongside of the Abrahamic covenant, in order to be a great nation, you have to have, you have to be people. And God took Israel. He took, remember, Israel was, uh, Jacob's name was Jacob, and God changed his name to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. Those Those 12 sons sold their brother Joseph into slavery to Egypt. Joseph goes to Egypt, he rises to second in power, he stores all, he fills all the barns with plenty, and his brothers come there starving, and they don't recognize him. Joseph brings his brothers and their family to Egypt, and then all of a sudden there were, I mean, this was over time, but over a million Jews that were going to leave in the Exodus. So God promised that he would make, the, he promised uh, law and government through Moses. If you remember when we were studying in Exodus and they were going on the Exodus and God took them on Mount Sinai and He gave them the law. And He gave them human government. And then coming alongside of that, they need, in order to be a, in order to be a government, a country, you have to have law, right? You have to have law and order. You have to have something that's going to govern you. God gave, them, God gave them Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the first and second law. Then we have the Palestinian covenant. The Palestinian covenant guaranteed Israel land forever. That land that God promised to Israel, that promised land that Israel, it was a a conditional promise. As long as Israel would serve them, they would have this land. 
But it was guaranteed forever that it was going to be their land. We're, we're seeing that challenged every day. Then we have the Davidic covenant. Through David, God promised a king forever. And that king was not David forever, but through his lineage, Jesus Christ became king, and Jesus will be king forever. And then finally, we have the new covenant. That's where we come in. The new covenant guarantees us salvation, that whosoever will may come, that we as Gentiles can come to Christ. It doesn't matter what, how old you are, how young you are, how rich you are, how, whatever color your skin is, what nationality you were, what religion you were, if you came to Christ, Jesus accepted us. See, I can't go and claim the land of Israel because I was saved. And I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the reasons why I want to make sure that I go through this is because there are a lot of people out there that are, that are saying that if you're in Christ, that you're guaranteed all these promises that God made to Israel. You're not. These covenants were for Israel. The only one that comes into us is the new covenant. And the new covenant is actually mostly for Israel because during the tribulation period, it's known as the time of Jacob's trouble. That's Israel. It's going to be national regeneration. We're going to see the greatest the greatest revival in history, God is going to reconcile His people back to Him. In fact, in Revelation, read that it's an untold number that's going to come to faith in Jesus Christ at that time. But as Gentiles, we're not aligned with those things. I can't go claim the land. However, in Christ, we're all on level ground. You know what happened when we went to Israel? You would go into the temple in Israel, and what would happen is all the men had to get over here that weren't Jews, and we had to put on our yarmulke. We weren't celebrating Hanukkah. Come on, I thought that was a good one. But all the men had to get over here, and we had to put on our yarmulke. All the Jewish men stood over on the other side, and when we went in, we had to go to different places in the temple. The Gentiles weren't allowed in the parts of the temple that the Jews were allowed in. So we had to go over here. We were separated. The Jews were over here, and the women, they had to go up the stairs. They had to go up in the, uh, uh, in the balcony because they weren't allowed on the same floor as us. So it was kind of strange, but when Jesus Christ died, he said, I broke down all of that. There is no Jew or Gentile anymore. There's no slave or free. There's no black or white. Listen, there's no got the vaccine or didn't get the vaccine. Let me tell you something. This world is being broken apart and it's being torn apart. And we jump on one side or the other. And I want to tell you something. I am on the Lord's side. And I don't care if you have a vaccine or don't have a vaccine. That's your business, not mine. But do not allow it to divide our church. And do not allow it to divide our country. And do not allow it to divide our world. See, that's what Satan does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to divide. He, you, you ever see a lion go after a zebra? You know what they do? They separate the one zebra from the herd. And then they all go after and attack that zebra. And that's what Satan does. Church, we need to understand that God broke that wall. But it's really easy to forget what God has done. There's so many examples in Scripture of the children of Israel or of people who forgot what, ju- what God had done. If you remember coming out of Exodus where the children of Israel, God miraculously set part of the Red Sea. They walked across on dry land. God did amazing things for them. Moses struck a rock and water comes out and they drank in the desert. But what do they do? They complain and they complain. Oh, if we could just go back to Egypt. Oh, if we could just go back. We had everything there. You were slaves. How about the children of Israel before the Babylonian captivity? I talked about the the covenant of the land covenant. The Palestinian covenant that guaranteed Israel land forever, but it was a conditional covenant. As long as you serve me, as long as you obey me, you'll have this land forever. When Moses died, Joshua took him into the promised land. Caleb took him up the mountain, took on the giants. They lived in peace in this, in this beautiful land for a while. And then all of a sudden, Israel turned their back on God. David had a son, Solomon. Solomon disobeyed God. Solomon had, had a son. There was Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and the land was split between Israel and Judah. And that, while they were split, they split because they rejected God's word, rejected God's plan, and decided they wanted to be like everybody else. We see the downward spiral of judges where they continued to do what was right in their own eyes. Rather than listen to the law that God gave them, they decided we're going to do it how we want to do it. So because of that condition that God put on that covenant, Israel was ransacked. And it was the Babylonian captivity, 70 years in the Babylonian captivity. 
we see that we see how many times when we walk away, when we turn away from God, what happens? How about the ten lepers that Jesus healed? He healed ten lepers, but only one of them returned to say thank you, and he was a Gentile. The people who are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the next week are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. It's real easy sometimes to look at the Old Testament and say, man, they had messed up bad. But how many times do we do exactly the same thing? Look at America, who was founded on biblical principles. I mean, America was founded on biblical principles that, God, that, that we are one nation under God. And yet we've turned our back on God completely. We wonder, why is all this stuff going on in our world? But here's what I want you to hear this morning. The, the church sometimes forget what God has done. And we slide right back into our old lifestyles. How many Christians do, do, do neglect God? We neglect God's Word. We neglect our quiet time. We neglect our, we neglect our prayer time. We, we neglect our faithfulness. We neglect our calling. But I want you to remember that all those people, when they turned back to God, God restored them. In, in Judges, Thirteen times God raised up a judge. And every time He raised up a, God, a judge, those people would turn back to God. But we need to remember where we came from. We re- need to remember who we were and remember that we're not that person anymore. We're not those people anymore. I don't have to live in sin and darkness anymore. I don't have to live separated from God anymore. And listen, when you live in sin, you live separated from God. Paul wants us to remember who we were before the cross. Sometimes we need to be reminded from whence we came. Second thing I want you to see is we need to remember what God has done. uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 18 says this, For He Himself, that's Jesus Christ, is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abandoning the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached and and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through Him, we have both access in one Spirit to the Father. There was this division. God not only reconciled us unto Himself personally. Listen, when we were saved, I was reconciled to God. I was declared not guilty, but He also, rec- he also reconciled me to all people. Listen to me, there ought to never be any racism in the church at all. There ought to be no sexism in the church at all. There ought to be no... There ought to be no this person, or uh, there ought to be no dispute about who makes more money. There ought to be none of that allowed in the church. It'll destroy the church. We are called to live above that. People were divided, but now we can fellowship together in love. I shared with you before about the, uh, about the Mosaic Church. Mosaic Church, I think it's in Minnesota. And in that church, they had a Jew, a Jewish man came to Christ. He became a Messianic Jew. He recognized Christ as Messiah. And also, in that same church, a man who was a Muslim came to faith in Christ. These two people that, had, that hated each other from birth, I mean, were taught from birth to hate each other, became best friends. And they started fellowshipping together and living together and, and, and spending time together. And God did a miraculous work because all the people said, how in the world can a Jew and a, and a Muslim come together? They can come together because of what Jesus Christ did. 
And I want you to understand that, that is, that's part of the hope that we have, is that we don't have to be separated anymore. There's no wall of division anymore. I stand on equal ground, that I can stand before Christ. The Bible says I can come to the throne room of grace. And cry out to Him. I don't have to have an advocate. I don't have to go to some priest. I don't have to go to anybody. I can go directly to God. Do you remember when He died and that, that curtain was rent? I could walk right into the Holy of Holies now. How awesome is that? He made us a new man who can bring peace, not division. He has fit us together in this church. And we must remember why God God brought us together. We were dead, but God made us alive. He saved us. He birthed this church. I want you to watch a short video of Miss Mary just sharing what God did starting this church. You know, a lot was happening here in Seven Lakes, West End, North Carolina as well. I remember like it was yesterday. Kent coming into the bedroom and saying, Mary, I think... God has called me to start a church here in Seven Lakes. And he said, what do you think? And I'm like, Ken, I can't not say yes. If God's calling you, that's what we need to do. And almost right away, other people caught that vision as well. Mike and Gay Martin were the first to catch that vision. They wanted something more for their children. And we started meeting in their parents' basement and having Bible studies. And before we knew it, the Collard family came and the Hopplers, and we started growing. And it was a small group, but we were pretty powerful. And Ken had a lot of connections to Liberty, and and we started meeting in different places all over our little town of West End. And we would have people come from Liberty Um, Al Worthington, the um, baseball coach, a former former big league player came and he conducted a service. We had singers come. We ate together. Um, Gay Martin cooked us dinner more than I could tell you. People were in and out of our house all the time. We had volleyball games set up in our front yard. But our very first service was something so special. That day a group from Liberty had come down and they passed out flyers inviting people to church and we had about 40 people there. And Miss Fry, the principal at the time, allowed us to meet in the music room at West End. And we had so many well-wishers and it was just an amazing day. And that first service was September 11th, 1988. And our church was growing, our family was growing, we had two beautiful girls, and we also had the third girl on the way. But God took care of us through some sweet, sweet people. He took care of us, and He's still taking care of us today here at Seven Lakes Baptist Church. Uh, We were not your typical pastor and family. Um, Ken sold insurance to make ends meet. He also sold snow cones, which wasn't too bad for our girls. He, um, we made snow cone juice in our kitchen, and every night um, when he came back from selling snow cones, uh, we all gathered around and we had our favorite, favorite flavors of snow cones. And I know the Martins have had many snow cones. Um, from Ken, but that how we we kind of get all that money together, and we knew we had supper. Um, I also remember Gay's parents um, from their church had gotten out one of those boards, you know, that you see a lot of church have how many had in Sunday school, and you know how many were there last week, and and the offering. And I, I remember thinking, oh, maybe if we get more than fifty dollars, we can pay for the electricity here and the rent, and then maybe we might have something extra too. But God was good, He blessed, and He took care of us. Um, He took care of us so much, and He he still is so faithful. That's what's incredible about this journey. He was faithful from the beginning, and He was faithful to us. Even from the day He called Ken home, and I felt like He was saying, come home, a good and faithful servant. And I could not do this without our children. I have to say something about our children. God has blessed us with three beautiful, beautiful girls, Nikki, Christy, and Katie, 
and they've been a part, just as much a part of our ministry. They've invited kids to our Awana program, to our youth program, um, all the youth activities we did, and along with Bobby Sue Martin and um, Joy Collard and the twins, um, the Collard boys, and Tom Hopler, Mark and Stephanie Hopler, all of those kids. Um, had a love for Jesus and invited their friends and we had such a strong youth, youth program and we still do today because we have such a love for kids. Um, but God is continuing to bless and I want to thank my girls for being faithful and for loving their daddy, for loving me, for loving Summit Lakes Baptist Church and most of all for loving Jesus. important to remember in fact in Joshua chapter 4 verse 21 and 22 it says this and he said to the people of Israel I want you to think about this this is after God had parted the Red or the um, Jordan River and they walked across the Jordan River on dry land to go fight the Philistines and he told them all pick up a stone when you get on the other side just put it in a pile think about a couple million people going through this river and picking up a stone and that pile of stones would be pretty good he says this, he says, he said to the people, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. I remember walking from the storefront church down there and walking down here. We all marched together down here to this church. We did the ribbon cutting and, and we came into this brand new building you know, it's great to reminisce and think about all those times and it brings out back so many good memories. But I want to tell you something. It was, they weren't always good memories. There was a lot of hard times. I remember talking to Pastor Ken and he said he went to, I think it was a Wednesday night service, and he said he, was, he went in there and Christy was with him and nobody else showed up. And he sat Christy on the front row and he preached his sermon to Christy on the front row. And I'm sure that he was beat up and tired after, after doing that. But he kept on going. He was faithful. It's our tendency, it's our tendency to look back and remember how good things used to be and forget the difficult times. I mean, and there were some difficult times, financial struggles. Listen, just 10 years ago or 11 years ago, when I came here, we were $1.14 million in debt. We're almost, we almost have it all paid off because God is faithful. We have transitions of leadership when Pastor Ken died. I mean, can you imagine what a, what a void it was. Some of you remember. Some of you were here. Can you imagine the void of the, the pastor that planted this church, that started this church when he dies? What a void it left. But it's not, this church is not founded on Pastor Ken. This church is founded on Jesus Christ. And there are many people that come and they've gone, but God is still faithful. Josh just left us, it left a hole in us because he's impacted so many. Travis has left, uh, leaving a big hole in us because he's impacted so many. But God is not surprised by any of it. Yes, there's change. And yes, there's growth and transition. But church is not dependent on any one person other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 we're told this, Paul says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have left it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and striving forward to what lies ahead. Listen, it's important that we watch videos like this. It's important to look at those pictures and remember where we came from and remember how the church was founded and remember all of those things. But we're not, sit, we're not called to sit here and just look back and reminisce and say, Oh, I wish it was like that anymore. We are called. Our mission is still the same. It was the same from the very beginning when Jesus Christ said, love God and love people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. We are still called to love God and love people. That is a principle, a foundational principle on which this church is built. The other principle is to take the gospel, to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. 
teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, or baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, we have a mission to do. And if we sit and look back all the time, then we can't look forward. God has given us. You have taken on the new mantle. The new mantle is for us. There, you know, every year it seems that there's less people that were here in the first service because people have moved on or they've gotten older. But listen to me, the mission hasn't changed. The call of the church hasn't changed. And we, church, need to pick up the mantle. And it's not, we're not sitting here looking back at Pastor Ken because, because he was the greatest man. Mary, he was a great man. But he wasn't Jesus. And if this church was founded on Ken Hankins, we would fail. We would never continue and Mary would stand up here and tell you the same thing. This church was founded on Jesus Christ. And it was founded on the gospel and it was sharing the gospel. We, we just had our search committee. They've been, uh, we, we, we formed a search committee for a, a new youth pastor and we have tasked them with a couple of assignments. The first assignment that we tasked them with is we wanted them to come evaluate our staff, evaluate all the things that are going on, evaluate how we're doing it was awesome. I mean, it was awesome. It was not easy. Because when they come back and they tell you, well, you know, you, there's some holes here in this area, and there's some holes here in this area, and then it feels like, man, am I really doing that bad of a job? But let me just tell you how awesome they were. They didn't come back and say, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do that, because that's what I was honestly expecting. But they came and said, hey, we see some holes here, and we need people to step up. And we need to start forming some committees to start filling these holes and stepping up and doing the job. How awesome is that? That they're going to come alongside of us and help us. They, they recommend that we add a couple more elders and, and put some more responsibility on them. Our, I was like, man, our elders are work, they work all the time. They work 70, 80 hours a week. And they, and they were like, we need, we need you to give us more stuff. How awesome is that? They're also tasked with, uh, with finding us the next youth pastor. What, you know, we wanted, I, wanted, I, didn't want any part, I didn't want any part of that except to say yes or no. I wanted to make sure because I know some of the people that have applied. And I don't want it to be any popularity contest. I wanted them to go through. Well, they, they narrowed it down to a few candidates and they're going to be presenting those to us soon. But the work that they did was awesome. This morning... Um, the, the music this morning, and we had a new drummer this morning. We've got new people that are coming in and starting to step up. We've got other people that are ready and waiting. You look back here, we have people that are stepping up all over that are working in sound and working in video and working in lights. They had, they had, uh, they had ladders in here this morning trying to fix the lights. and It's just awesome what God's doing. But sometimes people just sit back and they say, well, I've already done my time. My kids are growing up. No, you haven't. You know when your time is? When you die. Then you can go rest for a million years if you want. And you'll still have 10 million more plus to go do whatever else you want. But we need to, look, we need to step up. So we need to remember where we came from. We re need to remember what God has done. And finally, we need to remember our calling. Look what Paul says here. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. He says, we're no longer foreigners or strangers. Strangers, You are part of this legacy. This legacy that's been built on the foundation of the Gospels. On the shoulders of, of the apostles. On the shoulders of the prophets. This isn't something new. God started this a long time ago. Have been built on the, the, we're building on this legacy of people that came before that started something. And we are called to step on their shoulders and keep moving forward. It's easy to forget, but we are not them. We are part of God's family. Do you know that God placed you in this body? The Bible says that He knit us together. He brought you for such a time as this. 
And listen to me, I look at our world going on and I think, God, these could be the very last days. And I want to be found doing what God's called us to do. Winning people to Christ. Seeing lives changed. I love what Hebrews 12 said about it. In fact, I almost started crying with that song this morning that Tara was singing because it's so, it's exactly this. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those people that went before us, the apostles and the prophets and, and Pastor Ken and all those people that were part of this ministry that have died and gone on, It says, therefore we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every sin and or wait and sin which easily or which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand on the throne of God. Listen to me, church. God has called us here for such a time as this. It's really easy to throw up your hands and say, oh, it used to be so good. Oh, this was this or this was that. Listen to me. This charges to us. We can't dwell in the past. We must step up and move into the future. We live in a new COVID world. But our mission has not changed. Our mission will not change. We are... We, we are called in the great commandment to love God and love people. We're called in the great commission to go into the world and preach the gospel. That's our calling. And all of those people that went out before us, we may do it a different way. Listen, we, why, why do we put all these cameras up? Because some people just can't come because of sickness and stuff. But listen, he didn't say, oh, you're excused now you got because you, you're staying home. No, he says, hey, get on the phone and call the people that you know and tell them the good news, the good news that Jesus Christ paid for their sins. Listen, we, might, we may have to cancel one from time to time. We may have different things, but it doesn't mean that we stop doing the work that Christ has called us to. It's going to look different. I don't know how it's going to look different, but it's going to look different. But God is faithful. And every time I think of that great cloud of witnesses that have gone on before us, and they're looking down and they're going, go get them, guys. Go get them. You can do this. It's like... It's like at halftime of a football game when the football coach comes in and you're down and he tells you this great story. As soon as he's done with the story, you're ready to go out there and tackle the goalpost. How much great... That's just a football game. This is life. The result of what we do is the difference between somebody spending eternity in heaven with Christ or eternity separated from God in hell. Church, we've got a mission to do. And God's called us to it. See, now it's our turn. My question for you this morning is, will you make a difference? Will you step up? Listen, I want to tell you something. It's already, we're, we're already seeing it. Uh, this morning, we're going to have Jesse and Lacey come up and their kids, because today's their last Sunday with us. He decided he was going to take a real job and go move out to Oklahoma. I told him I'm still mad at him about it, but we'll get over it. But you know what's awesome? Jesse led our men's group, and Lacey led our women's group. Lacey took charge of the nursery, and you know what? We've already had people coming up saying, hey, I want to jump in here. I want to help here. I, I've, already got, I, I've already got people lined up that are, that are going to do things. Taylor's going to take the men's group. We've got, God is doing some awesome things, but he needs everyone to be part of it. You're part of the legacy. You're part of the history of Seven Lakes Baptist Church. And it goes, it traced all the way back to Jesus Christ down on the cross. It traced all the way back to Peter preaching to those 5,000 and they all heard him in their own language. Those people got saved and then they went back to their homes and then they shared the gospel and we are beneficiaries of that because it reached all the way here to Seven Lakes Baptist Church. And we are called to reach our community. And the question is, will you make a difference? Listen, I don't know where you are in your walk with God. Maybe you're still dead in your trespass and sin. Well, you don't have to stay there. You, God brought you here today for such a time as this. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ your Savior, God says, I've already done all the work. All you have to do is accept what I've done as payment for your sin. 
Maybe God's dealing with you about stepping up. And you just aren't sure how to, how to do it or how you can, what you can do. I talked to two men this week that, were, that said, you know, when you asked me to do something, I just didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't, didn't feel qualified, didn't know what... And they were like, I was so thankful because I realized when I came in that it was exactly what I needed to do. What will God do if we step up? What will God do instead of just having, you know, three people on staff and we... we what, if God, what if God used you to change this future? That's what God's called us to do. That's what the service is all about. It's remembering about what Christ did, how He transformed my life. Remembering how, what He did to start this church and found this church. But not only remembering, but we need to remember what He's called us to. And He's called us to do the same job. We are part of that same legacy. And, it's, and the mantle is on us. And it's time for us to move it forward. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Listen, maybe God's dealing with you. Maybe you're not saved this morning. I would hate to go through this service and not give you an opportunity to recognize that. You say, what's that word saved you talk about? Listen, it's, I was dead. The Bible says you were dead in your trespasses and sin. But God, who is rich in His mercy, with His great love wherewith He loved us, sent His Son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin and yours. And if you're, you're here today and you've never accepted that free gift that Jesus Christ offers you, the Bible says you are dead. The Bible says he who has the Son has life. And he who has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And maybe you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, but God's dealing with you this morning. You say, Pastor Chris, I've never trusted Christ, but God's pricking my heart this morning. Today is my day of salvation. Can you pray for me? If that's your prayer, will you slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Quickly, nobody looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed. All right, how about you, Christian? Are you taking up the mantle? Maybe God's dealing with you about stepping up, and you're just not sure if you can do it. Listen, he, you can't. He never said you can, but he can, and he always said he will. You say, I don't know. I've got so many things on my plate. Let me tell you something. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. You know what you do? You prioritize. Say, God, you're priority number one. And God, when I seek you first, then you say all these other things will line up. Maybe you need to prioritize some things in your life and put Christ first. Maybe you need to lay aside the sin and the weight and run this race and run it to win. You see, God has a plan for your life. Maybe you're dwelling in the past and the good old years. Lay that down and get on board with what God's doing now. Listen, I don't know where you're at, but here's what I'm going to ask this morning. If, if God's dealing with you, I want you to come and pray. I also want to ask you if you're, maybe God's not dealing with you, but I want to tell you something. We have uh, Benny Brown that's in the hospital on a ventilator. And he needs our prayers. I'm going to ask you if you will, when we have the invitation, if you'll come and just pray for Benny. And pray for Sandra. And pray that God will do only what he can do. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we come before you today. And Lord, we are here today as your servants, God. Called by you to love you and love people. God, I pray, Lord... No one raised their hand for salvation, Lord, but I pray, God, that those that are here today, Lord, that are struggling, maybe they're wrestling with you about what do I do and what's next. God, I pray that you'll be stirring in their hearts what they can do. God, we've got Jennifer that's already stepped up to take on the women's ministry and Taylor that's already stepped up to, to take on the men's ministry, Lord, but they're already involved in so many things, Lord, and so many things that they're doing. Other people can step in, Lord. We're not called to come here and sit and soak in the Word, Lord, We're because that'll just sour us, Lord. You've called us to be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. So God, I pray that you will have your will and your way on this invitation. I pray right now for Benny Brown. And God, as we pray for Benny, Lord, we know and recognize, Lord, that you're the God who can heal. 
And God, if it's your will, you can take him off that ventilator right now, Lord. And, and God, he can be back with us next week. But God, I don't know what your plan is there. And God, we're going to pray as if that's your plan, Lord. But if it's not your plan, Lord, we're going to worship you anyway. Lord, what a testimony Sandra's been, Lord, not being able to be there with them. And Lord, just the peace that she has, Lord. And we just thank you for the peace of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you'll just be with Benny, Lord, and be with their family, God. I pray for Aaron and, and his girls, Lord, that you'll just be with them. But God, I just pray that you'll have your will and your way. And God, we know that if it's possible, Lord, if it's, if it's within your will, Lord, he'll be healed whenever it's his time. So God, we pray that you'll just intercede there. We ask it in Jesus' name.